take out your Bibles and turn with me to John chapter 3 as we continue through um, the Gospel of John. And today's verses are 22 to 30. And that can be found on page 1055 and 1056 of the Pew Bible in front of you. And as you turn there, I want to say that I've titled this message, Joy in the Lord, with the subtitle, Our Greatest Expression of Love. You see, the joy that we have in the Lord um, should be lived out throughout our Christian lives. People should be able to see us and how we live, how we think, how we act, how we react. And they should see Christ in us. They should see our joy. And when we do that, when we live that way, when we express our joy in Christ, it is the greatest manifestation of our love for Christ. And so if you have that out, let me invite you to rise as we read the infallible, inerrant word of the living God. The Apostle John chronicles these words. He writes, after this, that's after the interaction with Nicodemus. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim because water was plentiful there and people were coming and being baptized for John had not yet been put in prison. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, He who was with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. And John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. Let us pray. Our Holy Father and glorious God, we thank you so much for how you have preserved your word for us this day. And we know, O God, that you have preserved it not only to glorify the gospel of your one and only Son, but that we who read these words and take them to heart, O God, can be transformed by them. And so, Father, would you do your work through these verses this day, O God, and may Christ be glorified in it. For we pray these things in his name and for his glory. Amen. You may be seated. Joy. What a beautiful word, right? Think about it. A three-letter word that has so much rich meaning. Joy. In fact, some people love this word so much that they named their daughters joy. It's a beautiful word. It's a word that, that when you read it, right, it, even if you can't define joy, you automatically feel some type of elation, some type of happiness, right? It's a beautiful word, and quite honestly, many times people take this word and they misinterpret it. Throughout um, Advent, I preached on joy. And every year we will preach on joy. And whenever it shows up in the scriptures, it will be my joy to preach Joy to you. And as I said, and I'm sure you already know, there's a massive difference between joy and happiness. Happiness comes and happiness goes. But joy remains consistent. And if you've never experienced true, meaningful joy, it's hard to understand what I'm talking about. But there is a joy that you and I are to have, that confessing believers are to have, Because we are confessing believers. Because we have been taken from the depths of hell and we have been saved from it and saved for eternity. (coughs) 
Remember what Jesus said in the previous verses? He says, I did not come into the world to condemn the world, right? So he's telling them, there, take it easy. I did not come into this world to condemn it. And why do he say that? Not because he would not condemn sin. No, Jesus did not condone sin, right? But he didn't come, and he, he, but he said he did not come to condemn it, not for any other reason, but other than the fact that, you know what? The world, you and I, when in our unbelief, stand condemned already. And so it would be like putting to death someone who's already been put to death. No, Jesus came to pull people out of death, out of the pit of hell, and bring them onto salvation, onto eternal life. And this understanding, this act of Christ on our behalf, brings us joy. It must bring us joy. It can do no other. Happiness is not good enough. I remember the old um, Breakstone uh, butter commercials. Remember that? Where the guy would be stirring the butter and the old guy would come over to check and he'd say, not rich enough, <laughs> right? Happiness is not rich enough for Christians. No, joy is the true word that should express how we feel, how we live, how we think in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so this morning, I want to ask you, how do you express your joy? How do you express your joy? How do you live out your joy in Christ? And it may be difficult for some of us to ask, to answer. Because we all live differently, right? But there is something that is to be consistent in our life. And that is living out our joy in Christ. And let me give you one hint on how you can do that. You put Christ first in everything. In other words, as you awake in the morning, you awake praising God through Christ. As you get ready to put your feet on the ground, you say, Lord, how will you use me for your glory today? As you prepare yourself to interact with the rest of the world, whether it be your family, your friends, your job, Lord, how can you teach me today to express my joy in you in dealing with all of this? Because let's be honest, life isn't easy, right? We, so for, even for, for those of us who, who are retired, Right? Retire from all the nonsense of work, all the, all the baloney that's involved with work, all of the fuss and everything else. Still, life is not easy. And we deal with people that can sometimes seek to steal our joy. And so how do we remain joyful amid all of the problems and the chaos that life has to bring? Well, we keep our eyes, we keep our minds fixed upon Christ fixed upon the finished work of Christ, fixed upon the salvation, the eternal salvation that is ours in him, the salvation that no one can ever take away, that no virus could ever snatch from us. Many people have died throughout this pandemic, have they not? Believers and unbelievers alike. And the one joy that the believer can cling to is that even if the pandemic takes us out of this life, Christ will be waiting for us with open arms. And then we will see the adoration of our faith. We will see the adoration of our confession. And we will be able to live in his holy presence for eternity. That's the joy that we have. That's the joy that keeps us moving forward each and every day. Sadly, however, people try to find joy in just, in many other things. Now, it's not to say that we can't have joy in life. I mean, think about this, right? When a newborn baby comes along, isn't that a joyous occasion? Yes, it is. Every family loves the addition of a new baby. My niece has recently had a baby, and it's so, it brings me so much joy to see the pictures that have passed around throughout the family. You see a new little life coming into your family, right? Everybody loves the idea of, 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 a, of a new um, child in the family. But there's a difference between the joy of Christ and even the joy of the birth of a child. A vast difference. 
When you think about the gathering with family and friends, that brings us joy. We just got off the holiday season, right? That brought each and every one of us joy. Even though some of our families can kind of be the joy suckers of our lives, right? Still, we enjoy spending time with them. Many people went out um, and, and go out to, 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 to massive games, Super Bowl and this and that and everything else, right? And they find joy. You see them clapping their hands, right? And enjoying themselves. But there's a difference between that and the joy that is in Christ. Many people gathered around the, uh, the United States in big cities um, just a few short weeks ago to celebrate the new year. And everybody was just filled with joy. Until they wake up the next morning with the hangover, right? <laughs> but we seem to try to find our joy in many things in life rather than finding our joy in Christ. All of these things are great, but they're mere happiness. And so I ask you this morning, how do you as a Christian express your joy? Is it expressed in the way you live? Or is it expressed in what happens around you? Right? Is it expressed in, in just, you know, when, when things are going good? Or is it expressed all the time because you have a close relationship with Christ? You see, my friends, as confessing believers in Christ, Satan is always going to be attacking your life. He's always going to do something to make you feel like you don't have that close connection with Christ. Even if you're involved in ministry, there's always going to be something that's going to try to bring you down to, to kind of suck that Christian joy from your hearts. But we've got to be on guard. We've got to be ready to stand firm in the joy of the Lord, in the joy of knowing that we have a close, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, a relationship that has saved us from eternal destruction. A relationship that has saved us from ourselves, right? Sometimes we can be our own worst enemies. Sometimes we stand there and we shoot ourselves in the foot. But it's a joy that we have in Christ that continues to save and it continues to nourish us each and every day. It's a joy because we love him, we trust him, and we find our, our faith in him. Let me share with you a couple of scriptures that speak to this joy that we are to have. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8 says this. Though you have not uh, seen him, you love him. Though you have not seen Jesus, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Yes, the joy that a Christian has in the Christ that they have not yet seen is an inexpressible joy that is filled with glory. As you express your joy in Christ, Christ is glorified in it. And we grow in that glorification. Here in Proverbs 10, verse 28, the hope of the righteous brings joy. The hope that we have in eternal salvation, the hope that we have that Jesus will never leave us nor forsake us, that's the hope of the righteousness. And that brings joy. But the expectation of the wicked will perish. In other words, those who are seeking their joy in this life, those who have no relationship with Christ, they will perish. There is no joy there. And so we see here that there's a vast difference between the believer and the unbeliever. And God calls us as confessing believers to understand this joy that we have so that when things come along or people come along that seek to steal our joy, we can stand strong and express that joy to the rest of the world. This is what was happening in John chapter 3, verses 22 to 30. You see, John was moving along, experiencing a great joy that his eyes had seen the Messiah, the Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And he's going to have people come alongside of him, people in his ministry that are going to try to steal his joy. We're going to see that right in these verses. And we're going to see John defending. He's going to be teaching and defending that joy. And it's an encouragement for us because, again, P. 
people will try to steal our joy. But we must stand firm in the joy of the Lord. Stand firm in understanding that we play a role in expressing the joy of Christ to one another and to the world. You ever been around someone who just really is is just thriving and living in the joy of the Lord? It's a pleasure to be around them. It's a a pleasure because they're just showing so much love and adoration for Christ. And it's almost as if you, you kind of look at that person and say, wow, I wish I had a little bit more of that. Well, you can have it. You can grow in joy and grow to express that joy in your own life. And that will be a blessing to someone else. And so before we get into these verses, there's three points that I want for us to consider as we go through these verses. And the first is this. One thing we'll see here is that there is a threat to joy. Throughout your Christian life, if you have not yet experienced it, you most certainly will experience a threat to your joy. And how are you going to handle it? Well, John shows us how to handle it. One thing that, that, that you'll notice about John in here is that his, his, his will, his mind is, is set on Christ and nothing will shake him. Now, you've got to remember John the Baptist. John the Baptist is a character that comes on the scene and then he leaves abruptly. And he doesn't leave in a good way. No, he is arrested, right? He's arrested because he's calling out Herod and, and, the, and, the, and the life that he has with his wife, Herodias, right? And who's, who's his brother's wife. He's calling them out and he's, he's telling them how, he, how they're being unfaithful to the, to the call that God has placed in their, to, to the call that God has placed in his life because he is a king and he is to lead the people in righteousness. And this calling out of the king will cause John his execution. But yet in all this, John remains joyful. Under all of this pressure, John remains joyful. Why? Because he understands that the, that the savior of his eternal soul has now come. And so we are to look at John and, and understand that, you know what, there's a threat. There's always going to be threats to our joy, but we can overcome these threats by remaining focused on Christ. Second point to consider is this, the defense of joy. Yes, John will show us what a good, solid, biblical defense, a good theological understanding of our joy, how it is a defense for us. And finally, the completion of joy. Yeah, some people believe that joy should be, you know, endless in the sense that, you know what, all day long, I should be feeling joy. But that's nonsense because we know that that's not the way life is. But when we are steady in the joy in the Lord, no matter what happens, our joy does not ebb and flow. It remains consistent. And that's what we are as confessing believers in Christ. We are to be consistent. And John shows us how to complete our joy and to remain consistent. And so first in verses 22 to 26, they show us, the threat to joy. And I want to say this, the greatest threat to our joy in the Lord is derived from our sinful desire for relevance. Our sinful desire to want to fit in to the rest of the world. Our sinful desire to want to get ahead past the call that God has allotted to us, past the life that has been given to us. Whether you're a confessing believer or not, The greatest threat to our joy in the Lord is derived from our sinful desire for relevance. We see these verses here, verse 22. After this, that is after the discussion with Nicodemus and whoever it was that came with him, after this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside and he remained there with them and was baptizing Now, first of all, the scriptures tell us that Jesus was there baptizing. But then when you read in John chapter 4, just the very next chapter, verses 1 and 2, it says, Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was um, making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but but only his disciples, this kind of makes us say, wait a minute, what's John talking about? Was Jesus baptizing or was he not 
baptized. And it's important for us to frame this because this is what this is the complaint that's going to be brought to John that Jesus is baptizing when you were the original guy baptizing. Well, first of all, Jesus was not baptizing; he was actually directing the baptism of the people. And so why didn't Jesus baptize? That's important for us to understand as well. Well, I got a couple of reasons right here. First of all, he was preaching and calling people to repentance. Jesus was leading a ministry. And as the, minister, as, as the leader of the ministry, his job was to preach to the people and call them to repentance. And as he was doing that, he was extending authority to his disciples to have them baptized. And so we see here that Jesus is actually broadening his ministry. He's broadening it past the ministry of John. And why is this important for us? Because Jesus himself is the ministry. And he empowers people to come along his side and to do his work. And he's preparing his disciples to be apostles. But there's something else here. The disciples were baptizing with water, but Jesus would eventually baptize with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And so the baptism of the disciples was different than the baptism of Jesus. It was a physical washing of water, which was important. It was ceremonial. But they would eventually receive the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And so as this is happening, as Jesus is baptizing, as he's calling his disciples and they're doing baptizing, as Jesus is preaching to them and extending the gospel, here's what happens. The threat to joy. Verse 23. John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim because water was plentiful there and people were coming and being baptized for John had not yet been put in prison. Now why is that there in a parenthetical statement? Well, because the gospel of John was written after the Gospel of Matthew. And so John writing this knows that everybody who know, knew about John the Baptist knows that he was beheaded. So he's saying this happened before he was beheaded. So you see how these verses actually give um, weight to the Gospels that were written beforehand? But John puts it in there for, for a reason, and the reason is for us to understand that John understands the full scope of what had happened to John the Baptist. And then in verse 25 it says, Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. Well, what do you think that discussion was? Right? They were probably saying, Who has the right to perform baptism? Is it you, John? Or is it this new guy, Jesus? You came long before him, so why is he baptizing? Why is he calling people to repentance when this began as your ministry? And when you think about it, right? Yes, it was John's ministry first. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 says this. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And so we see that this was initially John's ministry. But now the people are coming to John and saying, Hey, what's going on? Why is this guy baptizing when this was your ministry? To whom does the ministry of baptism belong? Does it belong to you, John? Or does it belong to Jesus? Do you see what's getting stirred up here? This is, a, this is a threat to joy. Now, if John were some type of modern day um, uh, 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 minister, John might get upset at that. Yeah, you're stealing my flock, right? You're stealing my sheep, right? But no, that's not what happens. And we look further in the, in the verses... And we see this. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. He's saying, you're losing your ministry. What's going on, John? Wake up. This guy is supplanting your ministry. Do you see what's happening here? You've got the people who are claiming to be believers who are claiming to follow John, trying to lead John to rise up against Christ. What we see here is ministerial jealousy. Yes, that happens. Ministerial jealousy. One person is leading a ministry and perhaps they started it. And now another person comes along and their ministry is growing greater than the one who started it and people get jealous. And this is wrong. It's wrong because you know what? We don't know what ministry God has allotted 
to us as individuals, but we know that he has a lot of the ministry. And when we look at the ministry of Christ and the ministry of John the Baptist, it's a no-brainer to know that the ministry of Christ must increase and John's ministry must decrease. Because John's ministry was to point to Christ. And that's what, the, that's what these people don't get. That's what John's disciples and the, whoever this Jew was that, was that that was in this discussion, that's what they didn't get. That this ministry belongs to Jesus. That everything belongs to Jesus. That when John came down out of the wilderness, that call of John belonged to Jesus as well. And so we should really stop here for a moment and say to ourselves, everything in our life, every time we share the gospel, that belongs to Jesus. This is why the Bible tells us salvation is of the Lord. Let me tell you something. Even with your best efforts, you don't get anyone. You don't convince anyone to believe on Jesus Christ. Salvation is of the Lord. Christ calls us just play our role and share the gospel, and he will bring the increase. And so we see here that on the surface, this is a threat to John's ministry. Ministerial jealousy is the very same thing that the Pharisees showed toward Christ. They didn't like that he came in there to tell them that the Old Testament is fulfilled now in me. That Judaism is fulfilled. That I am the long-awaited fulfillment of all that you have failed to fulfill. It is ministerial jealousy that drove Christ to the cross. Remember Caiaphas? He says it's better that one man perish than a whole nation perish. In other words, he's saying it's better that Jesus die than we all die under the hand of the Romans. Ministerial jealousy. That's what's going on here. And many churches suffer with that. Ministry jealousy leads us down the wrong path. And here, John is sharing that with us to help us understand that this could be an issue for each and every one of us. Whether it's in ministry or whether it's a jealousy of something else that someone else has. But in order to fight this, we need to have our faith rooted and grounded in Christ. And we need to understand that everything that we have comes from God. This is why the Apostle Paul would write this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we, referring to the confessing believers in Christ, for we are his workmanship. You, my friends, are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that you, that I, that we should walk in them. And so whatever we have it is a gift from God. It is not ours. It belongs to God. And so we see right now that there is a threat to the joy in the Lord. But in verses 27 and 28, we see the defense of joy. And let me say this. Our greatest defense of joy in Christ is understanding our call. Yes, Christ has called each and every one of us to a different walk in life. He has called us all to the same gospel, all to the same salvation, but he's called us each to a different ministry. And he's called everyone, let me be clear, he has called every single one of us to the ministry of the gospel. No matter how much you know or how little you know, Christ wants you to share that with someone and he will bring the increase. And we've got to understand that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand, that we must walk in them. And so let's look at these verses together. In verse 27, John answered. And, and notice John's answer. John could have told them really easy, what is wrong with you? Didn't you people hear me when I first said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? What are you coming to me with this nonsense for? What's wrong with you people? No, he didn't. Notice how caring and loving John is. John uses this as an opportunity to not... To, to not, you know, uh, beat up his disciples, but to teach them. He says a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. Think about that. Nothing that you have, no matter how smart you are, no matter how strategic you've been in the market or in business or anything else, no one has anything unless it is first given to him 
from heaven. Apostle Paul understood this. That's why he writes in Romans eleven thirty six, for from him, referring to God, through him, referring to Christ, and to him, referring to the work of the Holy Spirit, are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Let it be true. It is true. Everything in life is from God, through God, and to God, that God may be glorified. And so when you think about the things that you don't have, give praise to God. When you think of the things that you do have, give praise to God. When you think of the things that you don't know whether you'll ever get, give praise to God. And when you can do that, that's when you know that you're living in the joy of the Lord. That it does not matter how much you have or don't have, you still can praise God. And John goes on to add to that statement that no matter that anything that is given is given from heaven. He says in verse 28, you yourselves bear witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. This is a powerful statement. He's saying here, I am not the one. This is not my ministry. I have been given a portion of the ministry, but you need to focus on him. And sadly, however, there are many pastors, many ministries that would want you to believe or want you to feel that you are saved by their ministry. No, you're saved by the gospel. You're saved by the word of God. Because if you're saved by the ministry, then when the ministry fails, your salvation will fail as well. And so we've got to remember that Christ must be preeminent in all that we think, say, and do. And here, John is saying this. He's saying, you yourselves bear witness that I said, I am not the Christ. I'm not the one you should be looking at. You need to keep your eyes focused on him. But I have been sent before him. In other words, I am a forerunner for him. I am the one who is calling people to him. And in verses 29 and 30, we see the completion of joy. Our joy is complete when, through love, it is cast upon Jesus. If your joy is set upon this world, your joy will never be complete. If your joy is set upon an individual, remember, uh, what is it, Jerry Maguire? You complete me, right? If your joy is set upon a person, you will be put to shame. If your joy is set upon riches or anything else, your joy will be let down. Even if your joy is set upon you as an individual, your joy will be let down. But if your joy is cast upon Christ, upon your love for him, then your joy will be complete. John says these words, the one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. This kind of comes out of left field, does it not? I mean, he's, they're telling him, hey, listen, this guy's stealing your ministry. And he starts talking about the bride and the bridegroom. What? What are you talking about here? Well, you've got to understand the times. You've got to understand what a groom, what, what a bridegroom was and what the bride was and what the best man or the, the friend of the bridegroom, what his job was. The friend of the bridegroom, he was the one that sent out all the invitations. He was the one that put together the wedding. He was the one that put together the feast. He was the one that if the wine ran out, he would be put to shame. He was the one who made sure that the bride was guarded until the bridegroom would be able to take her as his bride. He would not let the bride out of his sight until the, her and the bridegroom were brought together. The, 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 the friend of the bridegroom played a significant role. And, G, and John is saying this here. He's saying, I am the friend of the bridegroom. This is why he must increase and I must decrease. Which brings us to modern day. We think about the bridegroom today. We think about the best man the best man is there. He's, there's always the separate pictures with the best man, right? He stands with his buddy. He's been called the best man. He's going to hold the ring, you know, and he's going to stand there and be a witness for his buddy. 
He's going to help fix the, the, the groom, you know, put on his, uh, his, his, his flower on his lapel, straighten out his tie. The guy needs a little breath mint. He's going to give him that as well, you know, just so that everything goes off great. Later on, he will be the first guy lifting up his champagne glass to give a toast. And then he'll say beautiful things about the groom and about the bride. But then after that, the best man fades away. The best man takes a few steps back so that the bride and the bridegroom can move forward. The bridegroom and the bride come together and the friend never tries to tear them apart. As I was searching for some pictures, I found this one. You see the bride on the bottom of her seat? Her shoes, it says, I won. And you see in the bottom of the, the best man's feet, it says, shut up. It's almost as if they've been in a battle for the bridegroom. And the bride is saying, I won, back off. Right? This is sometimes how we see it. We see the best man getting in the way of the relationship between the bride and the bridegroom. And we say, well, what does this have to do with the verses before us today? Well, Jesus is the bridegroom. And we, the church, are the bride. And what John is saying is, I'm bringing them two together. And once I bring them together, it's time for me to back up. It's time for me to play a supporting role and to no longer be in the forefront, but to be in the background. John is understanding his place in life, his place in ministry, his place in the gospel, his place in in salvation. This is why he says, therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He's saying, I am fulfilling what my God has called me to fulfill. Therefore, my joy is complete in watching Jesus take over. This is how we should live, beloved. Our joy should be complete as we watch Jesus take over in our lives as he drags us away from the person that we used to be and he presents us to this new life before us. And it's going to be difficult because leaving behind the old self, it's hard. It's difficult. And sometimes we can feel like there's no joy in this new life in Christ. But oh, how wrong we are. Our joy is complete when it is cast upon Jesus. The fulfillment of John's joy is found in the person and work of Jesus. This is how John is able to say, he must increase, but I must decrease. Yes, he must increase, but I must decrease. In other words, John said, I have played the supporting role so that you will look at him. And when we share the gospel with others, we should be saying, don't look at me. Don't look at my messed up life. Just listen to my words and follow Jesus. That's why it's so hard for family to preach to family, for family to share the gospel with family. Because sometimes we look at our family members and say, your life's all messed up. I'm not following Jesus. You're a train wreck. I'm not following Jesus. Don't look at me. But listen to my words. My words are pointing to Christ. He is the founder and the perfecter of my faith. I must, he must increase and I must decrease. So I want to ask you this morning, how is Christ increasing in your life? How is the joy of Christ increasing in your life? How, are, how is the gospel that has saved you eternally, how is that leading you to a greater sense of joy? Well, the answer begins with this, by understanding that we are his disciples. We have been called out of our lives, just like the disciples called out of our lives and presented as righteous in Christ. Christ. Therefore, he calls us to be his disciples. And the true disciples of Christ, they forsake all others for their masters. John was saying here, I don't need any recognition. I need none of that. I am willing to shed it all. I don't want anyone else to look at me. Look at the bridegroom. 
Keep your eyes on Christ. I just came to present him to you, but turn your eyes to him. Jesus says this in Luke chapter 14, verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brother and sister, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. John is saying here, I don't care anything about me. I care only about Christ. And in his words, he's turning his disciples and this other individual, he's turning their eyes to Christ. He's saying, don't look at me. I'm fallible. I'm, I've got issues. I'm human. I'm sinful. But keep your eyes on Christ. And these words of Jesus can be sometimes difficult to hear. You say, what? I got to reject all this? No, what Jesus is saying here is, you must love me more than anything else, than your very life. And if you do, then your joy will be complete and you will be my disciple. So the joy in the Lord, the joy in the Lord, beloved, is the most blessed gift that we can have after being called unto salvation. And Christ has called us to, to grow in our joy in him, to forsake everything else but for the joy of of knowing Christ. And know this, once again, joy in the Lord is our greatest expression of love mm -hmm. toward Christ. Right. And when we express that toward one another, we're telling each other how much joy we have in Christ. And so don't let what's going on in the world, whether it be pandemic or politics or anything else, don't let that bring you down. Keep your eyes fixed on Christ. Stay focused on Him. For he is our joy, and he will make our joy complete. Amen? Amen? Would you join me in prayer? Our Holy Father and most gracious God, we thank you, Heavenly Father, for your love. We thank you, Father, for the glorious gospel of Christ that has saved us. We thank you for the joy that is ours, that is rooted and grounded in him, O oh God. And we praise you for it. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this ministry that you've called each and every one of us to. And we pray, Lord, that in this ministry, Father, you would make our joy complete. We thank you in advance for all that you will do, O oh God, for we know that from you, through you, and to you are all things. And so to you be all the glory. We pray this in Christ's holy name. Amen.